privileged to host four extraordinary champions of bicycling and the public realm, each one a tireless leader and powerful advocate of the Greenway and Trail Movement. We welcome Andy Beers, Director of the Empire State Trail, Terry Carter, Executive Director of the Brooklyn Greenway Initiative, Ryan Chow, President of the Rails to Trails Conservancy, and Dennis Mercado Soriano, Executive Director of the East Coast Greenway. If there was ever a time we needed our trails, that time is now. Andy, Terry, Ryan, and Dennis are all at the national forefront of connecting people and communities with our greenways and trails. And in the process, raising the public discourse around them. Tonight, we'll learn about their battles and the battles they've won. And we'll also hear about their vision for the future. Like you, I'm eager to hear the conversation and to plan my next bike touring adventure. Our moderator for this evening is John Orcott, Director of Advocacy at Bike New York. Let's get started. Thanks, everybody, and um, great to see you all tonight. Um, thanks for tuning in to another Spoke series. Um, as Sharon said, we have a fantastic um, group here that's um, you know in the trenches trying to trying to build trails, connect trails, get it all together. Um, each of uh, each of the panelists has a, a few slides they want to share, so we're going to go through those and then get into more of a conversation, but. You know, I just want to say in New York, in, in the bike world, we uh, talk about streets, we fight over open streets, we talk about streets for people, um, we read and sometimes write for a streets blog. Um, <clears throat> but some of the most popular places to use your bike are in fact not streets, but completely separated rights of way. And um, it seems like we could use a lot more of those. There are cities in the United States like Washington DC, Minneapolis, that have really good urban trail systems. Um, there's, there's, and I'm, and I'm sure um, some of our panelists, you know, are going to talk to some of those lessons. So why don't we jump right in, going alphabetically? Um, can we get the slides going? Um, Andy Beers, that means you are up. Thank you. So if you could pull up the slide of the Empire State Trail map. So as I was introduced, uh, my name is Andy Beers and I am the director of the Empire State Trail, which is a New York State initiative uh, to create a 750 mile bicycling and walking route that crosses the state of New York. And you can see the map here. Um, the colors in the map in green are off-road trails, the rail trails or canalway trails that cross uh, the state where there's a Hudson Valley leg, there is a Erie, the Erie Canalway Trail from Albany to Buffalo, and then a Champlain section, which you can see the yellow on the map are on-road bicycle routes. So the Champlain section is primarily a bicycle route for more experienced bicyclists, comfortable riding adjacent to traffic. But the, the major green sections from New York City to Albany to Buffalo is 550 miles, and 85% uh, of that is, um, is off-road trails. The project was started in 2017 when Governor Cuomo and the state legislature uh, uh, adopted a $200 million state appropriation, and the work was completed in December. So the trail is now complete uh, and open across the state of New York, um, and people are using it in, in great, great numbers as we've all been experiencing with these trails. Yeah, and this is a new trail uh, in, in Westchester County. Uh, Two new sections in Westchester County. So this is the uh, a place where there was not an off-road rail trail opportunity, and New York State Department of Transportation created this bicycle protected lane, for example, on Route 100 in, in Westchester County. Just one more slide, I think. And the next slide is uh, in total 180 miles of new rail trails and canalway trails were created across the state. And if it comes back up, here's a new section in uh, called the Maybrook Trailway in, in Duchess and. Putnam County is just a fantastic new asset. 
So that, that's really all I wanted to, I just, I know we're just, this is more of a conversation tonight than it is presentations, but I just wanted to give a quick overview of the Empire State Trail. Thank you. Terry, we, uh, we turn to you. Great, thank you, John. And thanks to Bike New York for putting this together. My name is Terry Carta and I'm the Executive Director of Brooklyn Greenway Initiative. We're a 20 year old nonprofit organization that's been focused on the Brooklyn Waterfront Greenway. Waterfront Greenway also changes as you traverse the route. There are open spaces and areas that are along the waterfront. There are urbanized areas. There's still working waterfront and industrial areas, manufacturing hubs and so forth. Um, about, you know, and there's one common purpose though to all of those different characters and that is to connect, to connect a greener, stronger, healthier Brooklyn. And about 20 of the 26 miles are currently in use. Um, and when it's complete, the Brooklyn Waterfront Greenway will serve Brooklyn's more than two and a half million residents, over a million people who work in Brooklyn. And of course, pre-pandemic numbers, uh, over 15 million people visit the borough of Brooklyn every year. Um, and here in Brooklyn, we're proud to be home of the country's first dedicated bike path. Um, that's the second slide that shows Ocean Parkway. Um, so Ocean Parkway um, opened in 1894 during the original bike boom in America, right? And this was a, a bike path that was designed by Frederick Law Olmsted and Calvert Vox, the same two guys who designed Central Park and Prospect Park and so many other parks around our country. Um, and, you know, this is about a five mile route that goes from Prospect Park to Coney Island. And just a, a quick little fun fact, um, a lot of the greenways in New York City connect park and open space. Um, so, you know, there are over 100 miles of greenway on New York City parkland. Um, that's part of a total, you know, uh, aspiration of 400 miles, which we'll get to in just a second. But, you know, greenways are an old idea is the point of this slide here with increasing relevance today. Um, they provide access to waterfront areas and parks and open space. They provide access to new job centers, especially burgeoning job centers outside of the Manhattan core, as in New York City's five boroughs, the kind of central business district is distributing across the rest of the city. Also the implementation of greenways, of course, creates jobs as I know others will talk about tonight. They um, provide public health and healthy lifestyle opportunities for people of all ages and abilities. They really are connectors to you know, people and throughout the five boroughs. And as a transportation solution, they form, the greenways form the backbone of the New York City bicycle network, again, serving the broadest you know, base of users. Another little fun fact, um, New York City DOT puts out a cycling in the city report every year. Um, and in 2019, so pre-pandemic levels, there were about 2 million uh, New Yorkers. So let's say about 25% um, almost of people who ride a bike once a day, uh, sorry, ride a bike at least once. And um, approximately half of those, so 900,000 um, ride regularly. So, you know, the, the greenways and our bike network at large are real climate solutions, getting more people out of cars. Um, but the, you know, the problem is, so this is all great news, right? Greenways deliver a whole bunch of benefits to a whole bunch of people, and that's all wonderful. But the problem is that, you know, what's missing in New York is that we have, we don't have a citywide approach to implementing our greenways. Um, that's coordinated across city agencies, that's coordinated across the five boroughs, and coordinated across community district boundaries, and the way that New York City politics work um, a lot of times community members can speak out for or against amenities like greenways or parks or bike lanes, open streets and so forth, um, which we're seeing uh, happen, <laughs> play out now in real time. Um, you know, so the greenway implementation in New York City has been largely opportunistic and reactive, and that needs to change, full stop. Um, just a quick snapshot of the map that we're looking at in the five boroughs. These two maps, the one on the left shows the vision of a 400 mile network of connected greenways. And of course, I think probably everyone on the call today would agree that New York City needs more than 400 miles, um, but we'll start with where we're at. So um, that's the vision is a 400 mile connected network of greenways. And on the right is the current reality, which you can see is sort of a rainbow um, piecemeal approach. I mean, if anything depicts the sort of 
uncoordinated between agencies and opportunistic piecemeal approach to Greenway implementation, I think this map does it. Um, there are approximately 300 miles of Greenway that are in existence right now in various states of repair. Um, so there are many of those miles of Greenway that need some significant upgrades and updating. Um, and then about 100 miles of Greenway that don't yet exist at all and need to be planned and designed and constructed. Um, and you know, just recently, by way of wrapping up Brooklyn Greenway Initiative and over you know, 30, about 35 organizations and growing, um, Greenway aligned organizations from throughout the city got together um, to really push for a coordinated effort um, for implementing greenways, um, pushing for federal investment in our greenway system, um, and really, really trying to change the approach that the city has to building the greenways to be more proactive, more coordinated, and more strategic to deliver the greatest benefits to the greatest number of people. Um, you know, and to break the cycle of, of you know, greenway popularity and implementation that you know that comes with every election cycle. Yes, without, without any pause at all, we're gonna to turn to Ryan Chow and um, dive into his material. Sure, um, hi everyone, I'm Ryan Chow. I'm the president of Rails to Trails Conservancy. Uh, I've had some recent good news in that I just got my vaccine shot, first one. Uh, bad news is I'm feeling a little side effect. So um, hopefully I will be somewhat coherent and <laughs> appreciate your patience. It's good to have it, but I've, I've been feeling kind of woozy today. Um, Real quickly on Rails to Trails Conservancy, we were formed in 1986 with the goal of transforming unused railroad corridors into multi-use trails. Uh, at that time, there were about 200 rail trails across the country. Over the next 35 years, uh, we've helped to create some of the legal and government funding programs such that trails uh, now proliferate uh, quite broadly across the country. Uh, certainly, as mentioned, not to, as connected as we'd like them to be, but there are now 24,000 miles of rail trails in America over 40,000 miles of multi-use trails. Uh, so we try to advocate at the federal level for increased funding um, and consideration of transportation alternatives. We have a number of key initiatives, uh, including Trail Nation, where we try to uh, implement interconnected trail systems in different parts of the country. Um, we started a project a couple of years ago called the Great American Rail Trail, which will be the first protected uh, multi-use trail that will span the country from Washington, D.C. to Washington State. And we have the app's uh, most popular, or the, the internet's most popular app uh, for locating and using trails called Trail Link. That said, I, my slides are more about uh, context just for this discussion overall. And want to share a little bit of research, some findings we've had uh, just on what last year meant, what the pandemic has meant to trails, walking and biking. Uh, you all know this, you're, you're living it, but uh, you can see there on the on the chart, uh, there was just a, herd, a huge surge in trail use as people look for a safe way to get outside, maintain their health and wellness. Uh, and you can see there in March, um, a 200% increase in trail use nationwide. That settled to some degree, but it's remained at about 50% uh, above the previous year throughout 2020 and into 2021. Um, you know, we've seen some things that honestly we never thought would be possible, that as people really understood the benefits of trails walking and biking in new ways, we saw uh, cities close streets overnight for trails walking and biking. You all know there's been a huge boom in not only bike use, but bike sales. Uh, at the same time, um, you know, this has also made more and more clear the inequities and disparities in terms of access to safe outdoor activity um, based on where you live and um, and your race. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So we did some research uh, over the past year, wanted to share a little bit of that, uh, and I think it's quite significant in a, in a number of ways. One is that um, we just saw that uh, three quarters of the people we surveyed uh, indicated that they felt trails contributed significantly to the well-being of their community, um, of their own health and wellness. I think this might be a little different slide than I shared, but I'll just go with it. Um, that people felt that it was important uh, to have safe access, not just in the pandemic, or, but more generally, uh, and that people more and more were getting out to use the trail uh, and their um, assets more frequently. Let's go to the next slide. Um, yeah, and one thing I should note is that we, so we saw this change in attitudes 
how people viewed trails, walking, and biking, uh, and safe outdoor activity. What's really interesting, though, is we saw a concurrent shift in behaviors. Normally, you see in a big social change event, attitudes change at some point, behavior follows. In this case, they changed simultaneously overnight. You can see some of the data there, but 66% uh, of people surveyed uh, were getting outside the same or even more uh, during the pandemic. You can see there, I mentioned before, um, slow streets, closed streets, uh, 70 plus major metros across the country did it last year. And then the graph on the right, um, certainly there was an increase in all different forms of outdoor activity, but trail use was just significant in a different way. Uh, you see hiking there, 16%, camping, 28%. But trail use, uh, just in terms of the access, uh, the location, the way that almost anyone can participate in trails, walking, biking, significantly more than just about any other activity. Oh, so just the last thing I'd note. So uh, getting this feedback at a macro level, we launched a campaign last fall called Trail Moments. Uh, and it was asking people on trails to share their own individual experiences what did this kind of access and outdoor activity mean to them? And you see a few quotes below, but um, it was just significant and heartwarming, heartbreaking in different ways. And we had over 1500 people submit their own perspectives. Uh, it wasn't just a way to get outside, but people really uh, maintained a certain mental well-being, weird stories of people uh, more connected to their communities, more connected to each other, even un unlocking a new form of health and wellness that it didn't even necessarily prioritize before. So I just say, as we go into the conversation, um, it's been a significant moment for our movement, uh, whether it's the bike boom, the trail boom, uh, but we don't know if this will last. So I think all of us in this movement have an opportunity and a need to not only sustain these attitudes and behaviors, but really translate them into deeper investment long-term to this important people-centered infrastructure. Thank you. Thanks, Ryan. Um, Dennis, why don't we just plunge ahead? Let's do it. Thanks, John. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I just want to ask, can you feel the wind at our backs in this spring of recovery? Really, trails and greenways have proven essential for public health, for equity, for climate during the pandemic as people have flocked to our linear parks for physical and mental health, as the panelists have already made clear. Our advisory board member, and New York Parks Commissioner Mitchell Silver calls greenways and parks havens of health and sanctuaries of sanity. And I hope you've been able to get out to enjoy them a whole lot this past year. I lead the nonprofit spearheading the Maine to Florida East Coast Greenway that last year became the most visited park in America with 50 million bike rides, runs, and walks. By decade's end, we aim to build hundreds more miles of greenway and to double the Greenway's visitation. I'm speaking with you from Durham, North Carolina, where I moved from New York 10 years ago to focus on building more of the East Coast Greenway in the Southeast. Our Greenway, though, was born at the American Youth Hostel in New York on the Upper West Side of Manhattan almost 30 years ago. Audacious visionaries such as New York Greenway planner Karen Votava and a handful of other local leaders from Boston down to DC, set out to complete a greenway that connected cities throughout the Eastern Seaboard. And I was lucky enough to join the team 12 years ago. We've continued remarkable growth in partnership with key organizations like Bike New York and my fellow panelists. Our nonprofit has actually turned $15 million in donations into $1.5 billion in public investment to plan, design, and build over a thousand miles of completed East Coast Greenway. And the year 2021 is our moment. It's a moment where our greenways and trails are critical antidotes to the pandemic. The bike boom doesn't have to go bust next year as travel picks up, but it probably will unless we seize the moment and inspire federal officials to invest in greenway stimulus, at least $10 billion, put another way, just half a percent of the $2 trillion infrastructure proposal that Biden is proposing. That level of funding could complete the East Coast Greenway, could complete the, the New York network, and so many greenway systems all over the country. And it's the epitome of building back better. But we need your help to get it done. 
Senate Majority Leader Schumer could be the champion that makes Greenway's stimulus happen. And so could other federal representatives from New York and throughout the region. But they'll only step up for this opportunity if we're all emailing and calling and tweeting and otherwise showing our public support, calling for Greenway stimulus to make biking safe and accessible for all Americans, especially those who need it most. So like Robin Williams and Dead Poets Society said, I urge all of us to seize the day, carpe diem, so that people of all ages and abilities can enjoy the beauty of biking in their neighborhood throughout their borough and even on big trips to the next city and beyond. Please sign up for our effort at greenwaystimulus.org. And when you're not advocating for Greenway Stimulus, explore greenway.org and plan your East Coast Greenway trip to the South in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and beyond, or North to Connecticut and all of New England. You can take Metro North to New Haven and bike up the Farmington Valley, which is a lovely stretch. It's mostly off-road for 50 miles to Simsbury. And I have to share, to share a perfect pandemic recovery celebration. I invite all of you to join our first ever Greenway bike ride from New York to Philadelphia on the weekend of August 28th and 29th. Over half of the 125 miles on the Greenways are on Greenways like the DNR Canal towpath close to Princeton in our stopover city. And I recommend though, if you wanna join us, register ASAP at greenway.org because we're on pace to sell out our 500 spaces within a few weeks. I'm really looking forward to the conversation tonight and speaking with all of you, learning from all of you. Let's make the most of this moment and have fun while we're at it, building a healthy and equitable people and planet together. Thank you. Thanks, Dennis. Um, and thanks to all of you for these, you know, for these pieces of information, these great images and, and uh, you know, elements of research on people using trails and greenways more. But let's stay on this idea that there is a moment today for greenways um, that Dennis was, was, you know, was really hitting hard. Um, some of you guys talked about the pandemic and increased use and, and need for open space near where we live. Um, and Dennis mentioned the Biden stimulus. Um, and we also have just, just in the course of you know, how things go, the federal transportation spending bill needs to get redone, right? Um, and amazingly, somehow, New York State sort of has you know, synced up with all of this stuff to open the Empire State Trail um, just this year. So what else is there? What else sort of speaks to this moment um, regarding greenways uh, in terms of there's federal money to be had. We've sort of seen the bike boom. and and other, other, other uses. Um, we need to put the country back to work, right? We still have you know, tremendous unemployment in this country. Um, anything else that sort of speaks to that moment that, you know, that we should really hit when we're talking to Congress and also making sure that our local governments are ready if Congress acts? Great, <clears throat> uh, I'll start. I have a feeling we'll just kind of riff this whole uh, conversation like a little jazz quartet maybe. Uh, but just just to start, um, yeah, honestly, they, I don't know if we've ever seen uh, as much opportunity from for investment from so many different avenues as right now. Um, you mentioned before, John, um, the surface transportation reauthorization. That's in many ways kind of the tip of the spear. So uh, it was extended last year to uh, September of this year. It made it through the House, not the Senate, but the Senate has picked it up and in some ways is being uh, even more aggressive than the House. So some of the pieces that are in there um, or that we're all pushing for would be significantly increasing all the core programs for active transportation, uh, doubling the transportation alternatives program, significantly increasing the recreational trails program, and then a brand new um, uh, program called the Connecting America's Active Transportation Systems Act. Um, and that speaks to some of what we've, we've talked about before, which is there are good programs that go from the feds to states, but there really isn't the kind of investment to really make a full cohesive trail network. So we've been pushing for, uh, I think one of the most important pieces of legislation it is, is this new program, which really seeks to invest deeply in places and with connectivity. 
Uh, and I just say in, in terms of all the different opportunities, um, you know, earmarks have been reintroduced as a form of lawmaking. People might have different opinions on that, but there was a chance recently to get trail projects uh, recommended to legislators. Very recently, the BUILD program, now re uh, renamed Braves, just came out with a $1 billion uh, notice of funding opportunity. And then infrastructure stimulus, there are just so many different ways I think we can be approaching advocacy in all these different channels. But I think the continued important message is uh, trails, walking, biking are essential. Uh, they create more jobs than uh, the same uh, distance of, of roads and that you really need to connect them to unload, unlock mode shift and really switch short trips taken by car to a healthier, um, healthier alternative. I agree with all of that. And I think, you know, a piece to add is, you know, really kind of hitting home the message that greenways don't do, uh, don't provide these benefits, you know, in, in, in a vacuum, right, or separately, but rather provide the benefits simultaneously. So there's economic benefit, environmental benefit for this kind of green infrastructure um, in many ways, uh, as well as community cohesiveness and kind of social benefits. So really the greenways and trails across our country um, are these triple bottom line pieces of vital public infrastructure and need to be prioritized as such. Um, so one, one, thing, one thing I do wanna note, um, Bike New York is part of the, the New York City Greenway Coalition that Terry has launched and certainly has signed on to the Greenway Stimulus. Um, but you know, we're, we're, you know, we're very much New York focused. So what, how does this all look? I mean, Ryan, you laid out, you know, you know, uh, an amazing, you know, set of opportunities at the federal level. Um, the last time we looked at the connecting active transportation bill, we didn't have any New York representative signed on to it. We weren't, we weren't all that up on it. And it had the unfortunate sort of fate of coming out right before the pandemic really hit hard, but it was, you know, Senator Markey and part of the Green New Deal idea, right, applied to transportation. So um, how are we going to, we need to lift this all up, right, and say, if we're talking Green New Deal, you know, what's, what's more Green New Deal than a green way um, that, you know, that you build in your city or your state or your region? You know, she said triple bottom line. I mean, I'm, I'm looking at quintuple or something here, you know, what, what are the key things that we're thinking about and really caring about? caring about equity. There's no more equitable public space than these linear parks that we're piecing together. And, you know, we do need to attack, you know, work on addressing climate change with things like a Tesla and solar panels. That's not as equitable as the kind of linear parks and that we're, we're building together. So equity, strong. Again, to Ryan's point, uh, on jobs, 50% more jobs created building greenways than building highways. So if you if you care about jobs, let's invest in greenways. And it's it's the right infrastructure for the moment. Climate, again, this is mode shift, especially in a densely populated area like New York City, and public health that we talked about, mental health, physical health. So it's hitting on everything. But you're right, John, we're not getting the federal leadership yet. We're not getting the champion strong enough. So we really have to step up. We've got to work together as much as we can. And we do have some federal leaders. I'm not saying there aren't any, but where, where are greenways? Where is biking? We see Secretary Buttigieg, he's getting out on bike share. That's good. He did talk about multi-use paths, our infrastructure. So they're starting to say the right things, but we have to make sure that they do the right things. And that's where everyone in New York, especially, we've got Senator Schumer in New York. He's leading the Senate. So he could make this happen. So let's work together. Let's push as hard as we can. We make the most of this moment, whatever that's going to be. Hey, Terry, Terry, do you want to tell a quick story about how when we had congressional earmarks prior to 2010, that's how the Waterfront Greenway got started in Brooklyn? Great. Yeah, thanks, John. Um, so, you know, as I mentioned earlier, Brooklyn Greenway Initiative is about a 20-year-old um, nonprofit organization and really was born out of a a hyper-local community, a couple of community members who had an alternative vision to widening of a, of a street, a, an active truck route along the waterfront. 
Um, you know, and they like this idea grew pretty quickly for a greenway um, in a certain neighborhood and then it had to connect to other neighborhoods to be really vital and useful. Um, and this idea gained momentum really rather quickly. And in uh, New York Congressional District 7, where Congresswoman Nydia Velasquez has been representative for, oh, correct me on my math here, close to 30 years, I think, right? Over 25 years. Long enough for me to get districted out of her district, unfortunately. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, but she, um, you know, a large part of the, the Brooklyn Waterfront Greenway was in her district, and she saw the benefit you know, 20 years ago that this kind of multi-use trail would bring to, you know, her constituents in along the Brooklyn waterfront, you know, from, from Red Hook and Sunset Park all the way north to, you know, through Dumbo and Williamsburg and, and so forth. Um, and she um, invested, she was able to allocate 14, almost $15 million towards the development and creation and construction of the Brooklyn Waterfront Greenway. And that was a game changer. Essentially, that got the attention of our city agencies um, who you know, then also adopted the vision that was born out of the community, created an implementation plan with a, a series of detailed you know, capital projects that made up the whole. Um, and that spurred you know, uh, over $200 million in investment. So Nydia, Congresswoman Velasquez's you know, $15 million, $15 million investment was essentially turned around and that leveraged over $200 million in, in implementing the Greenway, which is, you know, shockingly not enough to implement the entire Greenway, but it still changed the game um, and put literally put the Brooklyn Waterfront Greenway on the map. So that kind of investment, as you all are saying, is what's needed again today, right? That's exactly the kind of thing that you're referring to. Dennis and the opportunities, Ryan um, and, and Andy, what, what just happened with the Empire State Trail is that kind of forward thinking, um, you know, thinking about benefits, you know, decades into the future, that kind of investment is needed again now across the country. And if I could just jump in, at, at the state level, we're seeing the same thing. So we had this $200 million state investment in, in trails, rail trails, canalway trails, unprecedented at the state level. Um, we had a pause for the last year while the states were, and local governments were waiting to see what was gonna happen with their finances, but with the federal uh, you know, recovery act that's been passed and state budget is, is, uh, is, is in good, relatively good shape again. So we are gearing up in New York for another round of investments at the state level. Uh, later this summer, there's gonna be another transportation alternatives program, TAP grant program that's administered by New York State DOT. There'll be another competitive round of those grants. We're gonna have another uh, consolidated funding state uh, application round for trails and canalway trails and local waterfront development communities. And we're, so, so the state's back into business again after one year pause. And those of you that work on those programs, those, those there will be announcements soon that those, those application windows are opening soon. And we're seeing local governments, uh, smaller local governments in the Hudson Valley invest in their trails. For example, Westchester County with its own funds last year resurfaced uh, two thirds of the trail through the county and they've awarded another contract to resurface uh, the existing, the remaining sections of the, of the uh, Empire State Trail, South County Trail in Westchester County. Um, good. And then my program is- I, I, I lost a water thing. bottle there last year. Okay. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. That's the test, right? If your water bottle comes flying out of the cage, it's time to resurface. And in fact, my program is picked up again and it goes back to Terry's comment about existing trails and, you know, the need for ongoing maintenance and funding for that. We're working on uh, projects that will resurface in total 50 miles of the Empire State Trail, uh, 11 different projects across the state. Some of the work sections taking those on as well. So, so certainly I would say that at the state level, our elected officials, they're seeing what everybody is seeing. They're seeing this use in trails. They're seeing this enthusiasm. And the other thing they're really hearing is it's great that we have these, this Empire State Trail and our other trails, but people don't want to have to get in their car and drive to the trailhead. They want to be able to walk or ride from where they live. And so we're seeing cities large and small in New York State really beginning to amp up their game in terms of creating bicycle lanes and and mark routes to get people from where they live directly to these more long distance trunk trails. Hey, hey Andy, just, just so people get a picture of it, can you describe a couple of segments of the Empire State Trail where, you know, like state, local, and maybe some other institution came together to make it happen? Because, you know, in Terry's example, 
you know, we had a congresswoman putting money into it, but it took sort of a change in city leadership to actually put the money to work. So, you know, it's, it's, it's cool to have national campaigns, but I bet, you know, there's probably no two greenway or trail segment that's actually the same in terms of how it actually happened. And I'm sure Ryan has all kinds of stories because, you know, his group's been at this for decades in every jurisdiction imaginable. But could you just give a couple examples about how these things happen? Yeah, I, I, so, yeah, I'll give a couple from the from the Hudson Valley. I mean, I, the first is uh, uh, I, I flashed up a slide of what's called the Maybrook Trailway, which is uh, along uh, a, a 23 mile new rail trail starts in in Putnam in Putnam County and Brewster and runs to to um, to uh, Hopewell Junction in Dutchess County. A major new link that builds out the Hudson Valley Trail. It's, it's been an idea for a rail trail like a lot of ideas for decades, right? And it's owned by Metro North, uh, called, formerly called the Beacon Line, an inactive line. Uh, Metro North has not historically been in the trail business, right? They've been in the train business. Uh, but they stepped up in a big way and with, with funding from the Empire State Trail Program, they led in design and built this new trail. And then we have, we have the two uh, counties, Putnam County and Dutchess County agreeing to partner in the maintenance of the trail and just community advocates that have pushed and pushed and pushed for this for decades and suddenly it's become a reality. And you know, I think what we're seeing over and over in these projects is once people get a taste for these trails, they just want more, right? And so I've seen a couple of comments flashing up in the chat about what about Long Island? Why isn't Long Island in the Empire State Trail? Well, we couldn't fit it in in the first iteration. There just wasn't, a. there's certainly, there's many opportunities for bicycling trails and bicycle lanes and in Queens and, and, and Brooklyn, uh, but there was really no east-west route across, um, across Nassau and Suffolk County. That work, that planning is now underway and the Trust for Public Land and other group has released a plan to try to create, it's gonna be a long-term effort, but an east-west route from connecting from the Battery all the way out to Montauk. And in fact, New York State Parks has given a grant for the, for the, the engineering planning for the first 20 mile section of that, which would span Nassau and, and Suffolk County through, through Bethpage State Park, Eisenhower uh, County Park and so forth. So it's gonna be a long-term effort, but it's the same thing. It's, it's what you're saying, John and others, which is there is a hunger for these trails. And uh, it's, I, I can say with confidence that our state and election officials, they're, they are he hearing and seeing that. And now it's all about implementation at the state level. And it's about getting these federal dollars, the big dollars coming as well, certainly. I was really excited to see Metro North on your slide because if we are ever going to get the waterfront route up the Hudson to extend north of Manhattan through the Bronx and into into Yonkers and the rest of Westchester, um, it's really Metro North's right of way there. And right. um, I learned recently from a Bronx community board, Metro North had in fact done a, a right of way plan there. And so they really need to, to take it to the next step of engineering, probably a lot of it over water. So it won't be quick or cheap, but um, but it's, you know, it's at least being considered. And it's nice to have a railroad actually being one of the institutions doing the work. Hey, John, there's an interesting question in the chat about whether funding needed to come from public sourcing or could it come from private as well? And I just wanted to address that. I think certainly they can come from private sources. These are talking, you know, infrastructure dollars or uh, large amounts of money. So it would need to be large donations. But there's a track record for that. And we've seen that in places like the High Line, for instance, a lot of private investment there. And we can do it elsewhere. We see that in Philadelphia, the William Penn Foundation has stepped up to help Greater Philadelphia be a really marquee part of the East Coast Greenway. And they're working on the circuit trails network there. So in New York, who's ready to step up in philanthropy? Let's, it's time to support East Coast Greenway, Empire State Trail, Brooklyn Greenway's initiative, RTC, everybody, so that we can get this stuff done through helping the organizations, but then also pouring tens of millions into getting this infrastructure done. There's a great opportunity. Yeah, and this, in this world of greenways, um, there's a pretty well-known uh, example in Indianapolis, uh, the Cultural Trail, which really owed its start to you know the big philanthropies in town there. Um, and is kind of a you know a marquee urban trail in the way it really takes parts of city streets and parts of other spaces and goes right through the heart of the city. Exactly. One of the things that I think is you know really important in all of our great greenways and trails, but you know I think about this particularly in a in a in the urban context. 
um, is you know the 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 multi-use and multi-benefit system that they are that we've already talked about, but also really kind of drilling into the idea of the design, the deliberate design of these trails and greenways for all ages and abilities. So rather than other types of bike infrastructure, for example, that you know here in New York City, you you have to take your life into your hands, literally, um, to ride around the city sometimes and on some of the bike bike paths. Um, and greenways are really meant to be for, you know, people who are just learning how to ride or families with young kids on scooters. Um, they're also the linear park meets transportation corridor idea, right? So they're places where you can, you know, sit on a bench and have a picnic or, you know, kind of hang out and watch the ships go by with your children, et cetera. Um, and, and I think that that's what the kinds of facilities that all of us here are talking about really do. Um, they're not just for the, you know, the hardy cyclists among us, but rather everybody. And that, you know, Ryan, I'm, I'm kind of going back to the question that you asked. I keep thinking about this. Like, how do we keep the people who have, who've gotten on bikes and gotten on our trails and greenways over the last year, how do we keep them there, right? And that's making sure that they feel safe, obviously making it accessible, um, so that people can just go outside of their apartment building or their house. They don't have to go far. Um, but it's that it's the actual safety and the perception of safety that I think is key here to really enable the broadest base of users um, to stay on the trails and to be really loud advocates for, you know, for more of them. So Terry, in terms of getting that to happen in New York City, you know, Andy's slides showed Metro North doing things in their right of way and State DOT doing things in some roadway rights of way where those links were needed. You know, we have a version of that in New York City too, right? We have some stuff goes on streets, some stuff is in parks or some other space. So what do we need to sort of make those all work together better or yeah. at all? It's a great question, John. I think, you know, this is one of my favorite questions right now, actually, because <laughs> what we need is a coordinated effort. So just to give everyone a flavor here in New York City, there's the Parks Department and uh, City DOT uh, that have major segments of Greenway, but there are multiple other agencies, city agencies, in addition to state and federal agencies that have jurisdiction over the Greenway system. So that includes the Department of Design and Construction, um, the Economic Development Corporation, you know, and then when we start talking about maintenance, we have the Department of Sanitation uh, that's involved, DEC is involved if, there, if there's any kind of green infrastructure elements, sorry, DEP, DEC is a state, a lot of, lot of acronyms, right? You get the point. <laughs> so what we need in New York City, to go back to your question, is a way to cut through all of that. We need a common you know, collated vision and an implementation plan. So something that the New York City Greenway Coalition is talking about and really pushing for is a citywide Greenway master plan that takes all of these different frameworks um, and plans that exist and brings them under one umbrella, right? Like bringing them all into the same tent. Um, and we need, like we need a status report of the prior plans and where they, where they stand today which greenway segments have been implemented, which need repair, which need design and so forth. Um, and then do the kind of the gap analysis on what's left and to create detailed plans for closing those gaps. We have, we have so many studies that talk about the benefits of greenways and what the larger vision is, um, but we need to get down to brass tacks of you know, figuring out the rights of way for the segments that aren't yet planned. Um, doing the detailed planning and engineering work to get to the design phase, and then getting the investment that's needed uh, to break ground and get these things to, you know, to completion so that more people can use them. Where unfortunately, probably, you know, I hate to say this out loud, but more than a decade out from a, from a complete, you know, greenway network, but we're pushing hard to like get it, get it done within New York City within a decade, right? Um, by 2030 is, is the goal. And what's needed here is a coordinated effort among the various city agencies to talk to each other and find efficiencies to make that happen. Yeah, I mean, people in the chat are talking about Staten Island North Shore. That's been in somebody's plan for a long time, but it, you know, we, we, we aren't quite you know, creating the step-by-step -step pieces to get it out. Um, Dennis, do you, do you guys 
are you looking for, do you have something like the framework Terry's talking about? I mean, I don't even want to think about the jurisdictional issues you deal with, but um, for the East Coast Greenway, I mean, how does yeah. that look in terms of, you know, we got segments, you know, zero through 200 and, yeah. you know, the next 15 are on the, on the, on the block this year. John, it's only 450 towns and <laughs> cities, so it's easy stuff. You know, it, it's great. I mean, we, we have an incredible team that's working on it. Uh, Daniel Pascal's on the line. He's based in Philadelphia. Bruce Donald's on the line. He's based in Connecticut. And we're actually looking to have someone to really help work with everybody doing great stuff in New York and New Jersey more. Um, but we're always doing that process. If it's, if it's gap, got to get it planned. If it's planned, got to get it designed and engineered. If it's designed and engineered, get that construction done. We want to cut ribbons, get hundreds of people out there, celebrate. Because we've had like the Connecticut um, Commissioner of Transportation, Redeker, recently, when, when Governor Malloy stepped up and said, we're going to pour $11 million a year at least into completing the East Coast Greenway in the state of Connecticut. And that's state dollars. They were just, you know, focused on it. Jim Redeker said, well, what's my favorite part of my job? It's opening greenways. Because, you know, you build out, let's say, a billion-dollar highway. What kind of ribbon cutting do you have at that? I mean, a couple of construction companies are, like, high-fiving, and that's it. But when you have the ribbon cutting for a greenway, it's hundreds of people. It smiles. It's little kids. It's the great-grandparents. Everybody is thanking the commissioner and, and everybody involved. So we're in the right business, but we have to make sure that we're helping put those opportunities in front of all the right people, the borough presidents, the mayor, the city council members, et cetera, to get that done. And it's fun work. And you know, if we ram our head against the wall in one borough or in one town, okay, maybe take a break there and focus on this other area where we can make some great progress. So sometimes like, like Terry said, opportunistic. When we see opportunity, we go after it and we get it done. And it's fun. And so in the last couple of years, $350 million in public investment has gone into moving the East Coast Greenway forward, you know, and that's from little towns to big cities and it's getting done. So we've get, just got to keep pushing, finding the opportunities and, and going after it. Ryan, are there um, places, states or regions that stand out to you in, in terms of figuring out how to deliver this stuff? I mean, you watch this across the whole country and maybe even the world, you know, just for comparative purposes. Yeah, well, I think one thing is true is that uh, when you see in one trail network partnership, you've seen one trail network partnership. Uh, <laughs> there certainly is a dimension which is highly local and based on the uh, constituents, the culture, all, all kinds of different things. That said, um, yeah, there are lots of great examples and, and maybe a few common threads that are important to note. Um, I think one is uh, in a, in an area or in a region, uh, having cohesion among advocates is really important. Sounds easy, but often if you can't get the advocates even united, it's harder than bring in other partners. Uh, certainly local governments and a cohesive way to really access state and federal funding. Uh, it helps to have a civic champion of some form. Uh, we mentioned the private sector, but I think uh, kind of anchor type institutions that can really uh, be there even as uh, terms change. And then a, a big vision. And some of that has to do with just some of what Terry mentioned, which is a real, uh, you know, the geospatial analysis that really is compelling in terms of a system. I saw something in the chat about comparison to the subway system, but something that really uh, gets folks to think beyond one segment in their neighborhood to it being truly people-centered infrastructure comparable to other other forms. Um, and I could give a ton of examples, but uh, Dennis mentioned the circuit, which is a great example of, I think, all these pieces coming together for an 800-mile vision. Um, we've been working in the lower Rio Grande Valley of Texas uh, on a 400-mile trail system connecting uh, most of that county. Uh, and it's been a mix of really strong coordination among local leaders, the University of Texas School of Public Health, but looking at that as not just an asset, but a real public health strategy, um, addressing inactivity and some of the other uh, issues. But the last thing I know, those are all local, uh, but they're also great examples at the state level. Uh, and one I'd cite would be Ohio, 
which by itself has several cities that are doing amazing networks, uh, Dayton, Cleveland, Columbus. But they've really looked at it as a state strategy, and they were the first place to create uh, what's called the Trails Caucus, which are legislators on both sides of the aisle committing to being part of a caucus to really push for investment um, in trails uh, in their local backyard across the state as a whole. So they start at the highest level. They have a statewide trails plan that then gets really picked up and integrated uh, at the local level. But I think what's kind of amazing is there's still much to be done, but for much of the state, you can go um, within cities and really get where you want to go. And you can go from major metro to the next major metro. Um, it just kind of shows thinking about it both locally and then at a systems approach too. That sounds great. Um... You know, speaking of urban areas, I mean, you know, Minneapolis and Washington, D.C., both, you know, both, you know, get mentioned a lot in terms of having good, good trail systems, you know, as cities. Um, are there things we could learn from those places or is it all just kind of, you know, plowing ahead with with what you got? I could start. I, we're not um, involved much in, in um, Minnesota, some around just supporting state advocates. Uh, I think D.C. would be maybe some of those elements I mentioned before, which is, I think, a well-organized uh, advocacy uh, community, some strong local leaders that have been champions for a, a long time. Um, and I think a real thought is to not only just the trail system as its own infrastructure, but how does that connect to the other systems? There's been real smart thought as to then trails as last mile connections uh, for Metro. Um, how does it really kind of um, address some of the other challenges with, with the other systems there. And I would say, I think what certainly helps, and this certainly gets to some of the advocacy, but just the culture. I think the two places you mentioned just have a, have a kind of a culture that values trails, walking and biking, and um, kind of interest folks that are looking for a more walkable um, lifestyle alternative to driving. Yeah, I think, you know, in those examples, um you know, a couple of years ago when my son was eight, we went to DC and rode our bikes around the Capitol and on the Anacostia River Trail. Um, and if I can ride around the city with, you know, or a city with my eight-year-old son, um, I would say it's pretty, pretty good network, right? And pretty good connectivity and good culture around biking for sure. And there are places like that in New York City, certainly. Um, and we want to connect more of them. Like I'd say you got to have the trio, uh, political, the philanthropy, and the nonprofit coalitions, you know, working together. So I think, I think New York's ripe for it. We've got the nonprofit coalition that's coming together really nicely. Um, we've got some of the political leadership, but we've got to make sure that we're top priority. Everybody nods their head as a politician about greenways, but I want us to be in the top three to five priorities, you know, so how do we get there? And then can we find some philanthropy to step up? Are there some key players at New York Community Trust or, or some others who are ready? They're, they love Central Park, but they also want to invest in East Coast Greenway and Brooklyn Greenway and, and Empire State Trail and these wonderful networks uh, that, that the city really needs. So uh, I'm excited to see if we can bring in some philanthropists to help get this done. There's a lot of energy in our local cities and villages across New York State. And I've stepped a little bit out of New York City, per se, because we've talked about that. But I mean, the way of a couple examples, in Syracuse, uh, we have uh, the Erie Canalway Trail went through Syracuse, through Syracuse. There was this 14-mile gap because it didn't exist anymore. And a series of projects were done by New York State DOT, by the city of Syracuse, by Onondaga County, to create this fantastic new bicycling route through Syracuse. And the city is really investing in bicycle lanes and routes to connect um, to connect people to that. And you know, one of the great projects in the Erie Canal went through Syracuse and Eastern Syracuse. It was filled in decades ago, and it was made into Erie Boulevard, a six-lane road that you could, you know, it was a bicycling hell, frankly. So our New York State DOT did a project, and they road it down to four lanes, and they reclaimed the median and built a new bicycle and walking trail down the middle of Erie Boulevard. You know, 100 years later, we're back to having non-motorized uh, transportation on the old Erie Canal. In the city of Albany, a project just started construction where the city, if, if you know Albany, the, the city is cut off from its waterfront on the Hudson River by uh, 
787, it's you know, multi-lane elevated highway. They just closed down one of the and one of the ramps to get you onto 787 and started construction to turn that into a linear park to get you from downtown Albany mm -hmm. to the Hudson River. That'll be done next year. Even a little village like New Paltz uh, is working on, uh, you know, they, they kind of geared up and they got a TAP grant to, uh, to, to, to build new shared use paths through the village. So you are seeing this, pro this, 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 this outpouring of effort. And I, I can't underscore the importance of what Dennis and Ryan said about this opportunity for federal funding, because the way most of these trails get built, you know, Ryan said every, every project is its own. We have, you know, it's years of planning and advocacy and getting the federal dollars and finding the partners and getting the local match and you build the next three miles of the trail. Um, the Empire State Trail was a good example where we built 180 miles in four years. But, you know, it's about money, a lot of it at the end of the day, right? And it is important that everyone who cares about this engages with organizations and with their local, their federal officials in Washington to make the case. Because there is this unique opportunity that it's essential that we get on the train here and, uh, and make sure that there is real money set aside. Because there's many, many shovel-ready projects. Um, yeah, that's, there's engineering and there's community relations and there's environmental review. There's all that to do. But at the end of the day, it's about money. That's, that's the biggest impediment to, to achieving these goals. And so let's all get behind getting the federal investment that we need. Absolutely, totally agree. Although there is some bureaucratic and technocratic skill to this too. Like I'd be really interested to know about more about the 180 miles in four years because um, some of the stuff I worked on in city DOT for the Brooklyn Waterfront Greenway back in like 2009, 10, still hasn't hit the road yet. And, you know, there are problems with getting, you know, just getting the machinery to work and, and deliver stuff. So, yeah, and that's about, you know, that's about, I said earlier about leadership at the top. I mean, uh, the way these projects advance so quickly on the Empire State Trails, the governor said to his cabinet, this is a priority, right? And so we had trails built by the Thruway Authority. We had trails built by the New York State Bridge Authority, by Metro North by New York State Parks, by the New York State Canal Corporation, by the Greenway, by DEC. And yeah, the, 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 you're, you're right. I mean, you need the money, but you also need the press. And so it is about leadership that we really need um, for people to step up and say, this isn't like a, an additional thing we do. This is part of core business of government of delivering this infrastructure uh, for, for all the reasons we know it's important. So I, I think that that is the other piece of you know, we're going to have a new mayor in New York City. We, we, we have other opportunities to try to bring these issues to the forefront. Uh, and it's, it's about people, people making that effort and making that message. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think in the last eight years, we haven't had that message so much at the top in New York City. But the good news is some of the mayoral candidates are talking like that. You know, they're saying, we're going to try to dig, get inside these processes and figure out why it's taking so long. And you know, it's, it's, I watch this stuff around the world and it's kind of stunning how places like Paris and London are building curb separated bike paths, you know, three or four years from conception to, to delivery these days, because the leaders, you know, the mayors of those cities are amazing right now. Um, and we just got to get there. Um, so, you know, I really hope everyone watching tonight will, you know, make sure to talk to your candidates about, yeah, we love the Flushing Avenue bike lane, but Really, it's still under construction. Come on, um, it's, you know it's like that that thing that that like eternal thing at Houston Street and Second Avenue. Nobody even knows what's being built. It's just been dug up for twenty years. Oh, that's why it's so great that Bike New York is putting on the mayoral candidate forums and the the borough president forums and and all of that. That's so critical for our work, so that they're hearing about it. Um, and you know, we've got to keep you know ringing, hitting that drum. And just over and over and over. And then if we bird dog enough, we will get in their top three to five priorities. And, you know, we're going to have some major progress. So East Coast Greenway wants to help all of you get that done with all these great groups. We got to get you into town, Dennis, to tell them how great those ribbon cuttings are. because Or, or get Redeker to come down here. Exactly. He, he's great. Yes. And I think that's where also this kind of, you know, master planning um, outside of city government. Um, we need government at, in the city and in states and across the nation, as we're talking about uh, for our various trails and greenway projects, 
but there has to be this impetus and there has to be the, the kind of, not just the investment, um, but the, the buy-in from the populace, if you will, so that you know, the, the implementation of greenways and the prioritization of greenways and trails cuts across political cycles. I really feel strongly about, about that. You know, having worked in, before coming to BGI, working in the urban parks world for two decades um, for a public-private partnership. And, you know, that's, that's where those partnerships were born, right? Out of a need to kind of cut through political cycles and create some consistency. Um, and that's what's needed in our trail systems in the city, across the state, and, you know, across the country. So Terry, when you were talking about Washington, D.C., you mentioned like good connections between streets and, and trails. And it's sort of, you know, or, and, and Ryan was mentioning how, you know, the trails sort of link into the transit system um, to make that all work. What, um, you know, I mean, in New York City, certainly we're going to need those connections. And, you know, we, you know, Regional Plan Association put out a piece last summer that you and I both, you know, had something to say about. Um, it was kind of, I don't know if it was, it was sort of hybridizing the idea of greenway and bike lane to talk about arterial bikeways. And it was kind of fudged and we didn't really know what that was, but, you know, is there, you know, and, and, and I really liked Andy's shot of the state DOT project because it, you know, basically just took part of the highway right of way and said, okay. And of course our premier greenway in New York was created by that agency when they rebuilt the West side highway back 20 years ago and still the best piece that we have. Um, can we sort of look ahead towards sort of bike path in the street kind of designs? Um, you know, I mean, and that's, that's, that's really what we see in parts of London and in Paris, the people, you know, the cities that I watch as our peers all the time who are, who are watching us back in 2008 and now we're watching them sort of shoot past us. Right, and I think, you know, there's, there's a protected bike lane, which is different than a greenway, but very similar, right? And when you're in a dense urban environment with very little available land, right, other than government owned um, rights of way, uh, those are by and large the kinds of segments that still need to be built and that can be extremely beneficial. The five borough bikeway um, plan that Regional Plan Association came up with last, last year, John, that you mentioned, was really about these high, like high capacity bike lanes. And some of them, the way they were kind of mapped out overlap with existing greenway networks, um, you know, overlap with other protected bike lane segments that still need to be built and that can be extremely beneficial. The five borough bikeway um, plan that Regional Plan Association came up with last, last year, John, that you mentioned, was really about these high, like high capacity bike lanes. And some of them, the way they were kind of mapped out overlap with existing greenway networks, um, you know, overlap with other protected bike lane segments. Um, but the, you know, the idea is that if, I think, you know, if you build it, they will come, right? It's gotta be networked, it's gotta be safe, it's gotta be, you know, make people aware of what's there. Um, and these on-street segments are, are vital, are vital connectors between our parks, you know, connecting to greenways, connecting to transit. Um, you know, they're, they're a piece of the pie and we need all of that. It's not that greenways are, you know, if we need to build, build only greenways in the city. We need to build all kinds of infrastructure for bike and pedestrian infrastructure. Um, and those other pieces are, are part of it. In terms of other forms of adaptive reuse, um, I, I think the, fu the future is so exciting. I mean, things have happened that seemed impossible, the shift in attitudes and behaviors, right? I mean, streets were closed overnight. Um, you know, the George Washington Bridge, you know, now um, idea of a, the bike line, the Bay Bridge in San Francisco. I think, you know, we'll have to see the full effect of what does the future of work look like? What does commuting look like? I mean, they're gonna be massive shifts in terms of just land use and potentially population shifts. But I think that there's just so much opportunity to, to build on this interest and then really affect the built environment. The one thing that was <clears throat> underway even before this that I think will return is just autonomous vehicles. And we were looking before this idea of if there are less cars on the road, if cars don't need to be parked, you could perhaps reclaim big parts of streets, uh, parking areas for uh, trails. Um, you know, I think there's more opportunity around utility corridors 
um, you know, I think we certainly would want to make sure these ideas of kind of full protection and uh, equal access are maintained, but um, it's an awfully exciting time to be thinking about the future of cities and then how does transportation for them. Yeah, I mean, Andy's story about Syracuse was just fantastic. I, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to checking that out now. Um, let me just, let me, we're going to do some audience questions in just a minute, but um, let me just ask you guys in terms of these, you know, these major things you're planning. Um, like Dennis, have you ridden the whole East Coast Greenway? Or what's the yeah. longest piece you've done? Yeah, I've ridden most of it. Uh, I've had amazing rides and walks. You can walk there too and even run. Um, Maine to Florida, it's just incredible. And so it depends on the season, right? If it's the heat of the summer, I recommend going up to New England and see some of the beautiful spots, you know, from Boston on the Charles River and then going north to New Hampshire. We've really come a long way in the last few years going north from Boston. And so highly recommend that section. We're soon going to have New Hampshire complete. Then it'll be Portland, Boston. That's probably going to be our next big ride after New York, Philly, be uh, between Boston and Portland, Maine. Great ride for the summer. Um, but you can go all the way up to Acadia, you know, and Bar Harbor and all that. So enjoy that. Also, come on down here in North Carolina, Raleigh, Durham, the Triangle area is actually the most complete metro area in the whole East Coast Greenway corridor. 97% greenway for 75 miles going, connecting Durham and Raleigh and Cary and some really lovely communities and then weaving in experiences along creeks and rivers and, and all of that. So you're getting the nature and you're getting that urban context and the ballparks and all that too. So highly recommend any ride anywhere, but check out map.greenway.org before your trip. So you think about, is this the right trip for me as an adventure cyclist? Or is this the right trip for me and my family and my little kids? Because it is a work in progress. Some of it's perfect for that for a whole day. Other parts, not so much. So check it out and before you ride. I've been, I've been on that section between uh, Brunswick and Bath on the coast of Maine. It's, it's pretty sweet. Nice. Oh, um, yeah. Andy, what about you? What, you what, 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 are, what are the pieces you'd like to highlight of the, uh, the Empire Street Trail, especially the ones that, you know, the New Yorkers downstate don't ride on a lot? Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's a great trail and it really highlights the diversity of New York State um, and track after years of effort from uh, the advocates just recently created the ability now you can reserve to wheel your bike right on right on to Amtrak now. Uh, so whether you're in New York City or anywhere upstate, there are 20 Amtrak stations within a mile of the trail. Amtrak is very coterminous with the trail. So there's another way for people to get up. I think we have a website, Empire State Trail, just Google it, it'll come up. People are, you're, are really pressing for more trip planning resources and we're working on that, everything from you know, another phase of work on the website for more information about where you go, where you stay. Uh, we're working on writing guidebooks. Uh, you know, it's not going to be available for this season, but all this will be available for 2022. Um, I saw some stuff in the chat. We have great camping along the Erie Canalway Trail for people that are self-supported riders out of camping near the, uh, the uh, Champlain Valley section, not in the Hudson Valley. There really are almost no campgrounds within five miles. So uh, there's, you know, we're looking at that and it's probably going to have to be more private sector that delivers that, but uh, we, we are looking for ways to build, both to make the Empire State Trail an economic development feature for these local communities, and many of them are, are challenged upstate cities and smaller villages and towns that it passes through, as well as kind of up the game for visitor services. So I'm, I'm optimistic that will come, but it's going to be a couple of years to do that, but uh, yeah, so it, check out our website. Uh, it does the same thing that Danny said. We go to great pains to illustrate the sections that are off-road trail versus those that are that are on-road, which are really not for your family to bring your family right. But um, the off-road sections are fantastic, and uh, if you get out there this summer, you'll, you you won't regret it, no doubt about it. And hey, Ryan, so what what do you have a favorite couple spots, or like what what since you're looking at the whole country, what's the furthest you can go without being on a street or a road? What's Somewhere on the trail. Can go. If you know, um, yeah. So I'm I'm real careful to to not name favorites, but I'll, I'll name a few that I I um, think about and I would recommend us. to folks. Yeah, just between us. I mean, one the Great American Rail Trail. So uh, we just passed 2,000 miles complete. Of it will be a 3,700 mile route, uh, and there are gaps, but you can with some gap closures, 
you can get close to going from uh, DC to the state of Indiana with a few places you have to navigate. It's, it's uh, moving quite rapidly. Um, and to answer your question in terms of uh, what, how much have, have I ridden it, I've ridden sections in Ohio, Pennsylvania, Maryland, but uh, we had this neat uh, partnership with this group, Sports Backers, which does uh, different events, a lot of it virtual. And they've done two rounds of the Great American Ride, where you can form a team, you could ride miles wherever, uh, log them, and ultimately the goal is for your team to get to 3,700 miles. So we're, uh, our team has done it twice. We're almost halfway there <laughs> with the second round. Um, but I guess, John, I'd just say in terms of long distance, beautiful trails, I mean, there are so many, uh, the Katy Trail in Missouri, Cowboy Trail in Nebraska, Palouse to Cascades uh, Trail in Washington State. Uh, one that I did do last year and would recommend uh, to folks here uh, around New York is uh, the iconic uh, Great Ag Allegheny Passage and CNO Canal Trail. Uh, together, those link Washington, D.C. to Pittsburgh uh, in total 330 miles. Awesome camping, uh, but also some of the most amazing trail towns, uh, most charming inns and bed, bed and breakfasts along the way. Really cool. Tara, your scale is different, but you know, same question. And you know, they'll probably get critiqued more than anyone else because everyone has an opinion. But right. Yeah, it's hard to name favorites in New York City. I'll, I'll talk about the Brooklyn Waterfront Greenway because I'm most familiar with it. But let me just say a couple of weeks ago, I was up on a segment of the Bronx River Greenway um, that also overlaps with the East Coast Greenway, Muskrat Cove, um, that goes into Westchester. Uh, I was there for the first time and it was just gorgeous. I loved it. Um, I highly recommend that to everyone. Um, but Brooklyn Waterfront Greenway, let me stick to what I've ridden, I don't even know how many times, hundreds, the whole thing from Greenpoint around to East New York. Um, the part that, you know, the, when you ride the whole 26 mile route, you really get a flavor for Brooklyn and the different, you know, histories of the waterfront um, and different communities. And I love that. I will say though, that one of my favorite segments right now is around Jamaica Bay and going into the Shirley Chisholm State Park um, that opened just a couple of years ago, pre-pandemic. You know, if you haven't yet been out there, it's a great ride, first of all. Um, and then once you get there, you're treated to these expansive views of Jamaica Bay. You feel like, I don't know, I feel like I'm in a different kind of big sky country. For New York City, it's big sky country. There's just a vastness um, that, you know, of the experience. Um, and it's just, it's really beautiful and quiet. Lots of, you know, shorebirds and, um, you know, if you haven't been out there yet, I highly recommend it. No, it's a, it's a cycling hotbed in New York. It's just poorly connected to, to the rest of the city so far. Um, okay, Sharon, you have some um, stuff from the chat, from the audience, from the registrants. Um, yes. Take, take uh, it away and, and we'll, we'll see what comes up. Sure. Okay, thanks, John. Um, Andy, Terry, Dennis, uh, Ryan, uh, we have a couple of questions that... Um, or in the realm of economic development. And there are um, several attendees who are really interested in the economic, uh, in the economic development of these trails on the neighboring towns and communities. Uh, if you could speak more in depth to that, that would be fantastic. Um, and uh, also two additional uh, more specific questions. Um, the first is, um, how is New York State, uh, New York State, I love, uh, I love New York uh, Tourism Agency, um, um, promoting our uh, trails and greenways um, overall? And uh, also, how are, uh, how is uh, New York State overall reaching out to businesses, for example, along the Empire State Trail to um, develop uh, more bike friendly businesses and, uh, and, uh, and to, to find out whether or not there um, has been um, a positive uh, impact on those businesses as well. Uh, I'll take a quick stab. That was a lot of questions, uh, but yeah. just, 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 I mean, briefly, 
Yes, New York State does have a program that they run in partnership with one of our, our trails nonprofits called uh, Bike, Bike Certified Friendly Businesses, and we're starting to grow on that front. I love New York. It has, they are very much going to promote uh, the Empire State Trail and other opportunities. They're on pause this year. I mean, they're not, we're, we're not, you know, we're still not encouraging people to come from around the country and around the world to New York State yet. Mm -hmm. So hopefully we will be there by the fall. But um, um, there, there were big plans that were basically put on pause for promotion of, of the trail. But I think, I think on the local business side, um, you know, people are speaking volumes. We, 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 uh, we, one of the new trail segments in Rensselaer, Columbia County, called the Albany Hudson Electric Trail goes through small small towns and villages in this area and uh yeah there's a brand new bike store that opened next to the trail there are there are new bed and breakfasts. there are new tour companies now offering rides uh, on the empire state trail a number of small businesses so people are voting with their feet and we haven't tried to quantify it yet but absolutely people are voting with their feet and there's a lot of enthusiasm enthusiasm in the local business community about how to how to how to benefit and how to provide services but uh, 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 this new traffic that's coming through these parts of New York State. Outstanding. I just have a quick example of economic development piece. You asked for uh, an example of that. Greater Philadelphia, we did an impact report on completing the East Coast Greenway in Greater Philly. And so the cost of completion is $240 million. And then we found it wasn't us because, of course, we could say, hey, $2 trillion. But what we had was we had an economic consulting group, uh, econ, salt, solutions, worked with NV5, uh, planning and design firm. And they found that that $240 million would turn into over $3 billion in economic benefit and health and environmental benefit. So that turns, that's a dollar turning into more than $10. Uh, that was an incredible example. And, and hopefully that's the kind of change and transformation uh, and, and generation of return that we can bring to New York as well. Uh, I think we should be doing more impact reports like that. Um, and then it, it just shows political leadership that it's a mistake to not invest in this. We have to do it, you know, to get those kind of returns. Have you found uh, New York State tourism industry, uh, tourism agencies to be more, uh, receptive uh, to trails and greenways than elected officials? That's a great question. And that is really Andy and, and Terry's wheelhouse. I, I do not know personally, East Coast Greenway. Great question. Well, I'll just say that um, uh, people understand that bicycle tourists are money. Uh, we used to say birds were money. <laughs> Bird watchers spent a lot. I mean, bicycle tourists, and particularly, you know, we're trying to get young. There are people of all ages out there, but there's an older demographic uh, of people who are, are willing to, you know, looking for these experiences. And so there, there is an understanding in the tourism world that um, that marketing and selling and promoting and making yourself available and friendly to bicycles, bicycle tourists, is a smart economic development strategy, and it's also paired with. People that are just in, you know, particularly in upstate New York, where every city is the same question: How do we continue to reinvent ourselves in a post-industrial uh, world, right? And so uh, every city understands that young people and getting people to, and businesses to come and stay and live and grow their businesses and having access to trails is an amenity that people want. And the other amenity, actually, one of our other big supporters is AARP, because another kind of underlooked uh, economic development strategy in New York State is keeping our retirees here to spend a lifetime mm -hmm. accumulating assets and now they're ready to start spending them down. And in fact, you know, uh, what AARP, they're big advocates of a lot, you know, places for older folks to go or, or seniors to go and, and exercise and get around, get out of their car. So that it's an interesting dynamic there as well that we have, we have economic development planners understanding there's a young demographic that really wants us and there's an old demographic. And so that, that is definitely coming together synergistically in New York State. Ryan, did you have a point on this? Yeah, well, I just maybe underscore what, what Dennis mentioned that in terms of kind of best practice around just getting all the energy and investment in the trail network, having a third party economic impact study is really, really powerful. Um, and we just had one for the Baltimore Greenway 
um, and similar uh, projected impact in all kinds of things, health, environment, um, and, and economic investment. Um, we have something called the Trail Expert Network, which is uh, trail practitioners. Uh, it's a learning community. We're working on something called the uh, Playbook. We might launch next year, which will have as much as we can capture some of these best practices. But I think that's a real important one, and to get the objective point of view of the impact, it will it will almost look like it's biased when you really look at you know the minimal investment for that return. Mm -hmm. And I just have to answer Rick Rick Gallo's question on uh, tire size on the Cowboy Trail, <laughs> seven hundred by twenty five, maybe a little skinny. Uh, it can be a little rough. You might want to you might want to get them a little fatter. Yeah, I would just say, I, you know, I, I grew up in um, suburban Boston, and when I was in college, they built the Minuteman Trail right through my town, and um, I, since I was in college, I was seeing it intermittently, but the effects that Andy talked about, like businesses opening onto the trail, um, the town of Arlington, the first suburban town outside the city, it really put it on the map, you know, in terms of a place to go, people hanging out on the main street and on weekends, and then and then from a real estate point of view, ultimately, it uh, wasn't quite Nyack, New York on a Saturday, but it was in that vein, I would say. Um, when, oh, go ahead. Um, when I think about, I, I totally agree with the impact of a third party you know, report, and we definitely want to do that in New York City. Um, one thing to, to throw into the mix, though, is there's you know, there's the, the job creation that's already been talked about tonight and job centers in New York City um that are right off the greenway i think of like the brooklyn army terminal the brooklyn uh, navy yard the hunts point terminal um produce market um and other you know there's like long island cities you know tech and urban incubator district um the, jfk airport could be one there we go that's another one right it's on edc's list actually yeah well, um, i think it's the biggest job site in the city um you know, and these these job centers, you know, so there's there's a, that aspect of economic impact. And then the other kind of thing that I always think about around tourism and economic impact in New York City is that, you know, pre-pandemic, of course, New York City in 2019 got over 66 million visits, tourism visits um, in that year. And something like a citywide greenway network, right, um, would help distribute those dollars to other neighborhoods beyond the sort of the typical tourist hubs of the Brooklyn waterfront or all over Manhattan and so forth. Um, you know, there are questions that come with that, right, in terms of capacity and, um, you know, a lot of other equity questions, but at least that distributed uh, wealth, right, or investment, um, the, the retail dollars um, and the spending. Um, gets distributed throughout a larger geography, which is really important, especially right now as we're coming out of a pandemic. We need to think about, you know, putting people back to work, getting restaurants open again, um, retail outlets working, and so forth. Okay, um, do you? Have, we're sort of hitting the ninety-minute mark. Um, thanks for hanging in, you know, both panelists and audience and um, colleagues. What um, do you? If you guys want to. Close us with any you know specific thought, Charles Schumer, Majority Leader. That's my closing thought. Um, from Brooklyn, um, lives in Brooklyn, lives on a great bikeway. Well, I just want to share appreciation with fellow panelists and everybody at Bike New York. Um, you know, my grandmother was born in Brooklyn, and uh, all the transformational stuff that's happening there, and then building that out uh, throughout the country is just so exciting. And I uh, love working with all of you and. We need everybody. Yeah, let's keep working together and let's get more of these the audience members engaged and see if we can get Schumer and all these others to become champions of Greenway Stimulus. Well said. Thank you, Dennis. Thanks, everyone, for uh, your comments. I learned a lot tonight. Bike New York, thanks for putting this together. Uh, I've seen people kind of in the chat, you know, put, they've been out to this trail or that trail, and boy, this was a great new segment. They're all great. So, I mean, two things. Number one, get out and ride your bike or walk or do a skateboard or whatever you do. And secondly, uh, you know, for those that I know many of the people on this call, you know, we're in the business, some of the panelists, but for many of you, you're just interested citizens. Take the time to reach out to your electeds uh, this year and just t t drop them a line, send them a card, go on one of the uh, nonprofit organizations and just add your voice because it does matter.
I guess I just say that uh, the Outdoor Industry Association came out with a report recently on who are the new outdoor enthusiasts uh, and their average people. And what they really want more than anything is the opportunity to maintain health and wellness right close to home. So uh, I think it's really important for elected officials to make it known. Uh, this stuff's not just nice to have, it's really important and people in your own backyard want it right where you are. Wow, it's um, hard to follow those closing remarks, but I'm gonna give it a stab. Um, this has been a truly phenomenal conversation. On behalf of Bike New York, Andy, Terry, Dennis, and Ryan, uh, thank you so much for the time that you shared with us this evening. I hope everyone will check the chat for links to connect with each panelist organizations because we've been um, placing them in the chat. Thank you so much, John, uh, for moderating this uh, spoke series. And a huge thanks to our audience for supporting Bike New York. Your attendance tonight lets us know that together we are heading in the right direction. Help us to uh, sustain and maintain our free bike education program as well as events. Visit uh, bike.nyc slash donate. We are grateful for any level of support. By the way, uh, speaking of heading right in the uh, same direction, the next few weeks through the end of May is jammed packed with classes and events you'll want to be a part of. We are very grateful to have uh, these classes and events beginning tomorrow. We are hosting a free bike touring class taught by Rich Conroy, our Director of Education. You can register for the class right now. Registration is open. We are also excited to announce Million Mile May, a free virtual bike challenge. Free virtual bike challenge. Registration opens on Wednesday. Uh, just in a couple of days, Million Mile May is open to riders of all skill levels, no matter where or how you ride. That trip to the neighborhood store or Bear Mountain will count. Our goal is a million miles in just 31 days, and we can do it. All of this is being done to support accessible public bike education. Registration opens next week, Wednesday. And also there are links in the chat uh, for these events as well. And also, who is not a foodie? And in fact, most of us became serious foodies during the pandemic. We have Foodie Fondo, Asian American greatness. Uh, so saddle up and celebrate New York City's finest Asian American culinary achievements while raising awareness and funds uh, to stop Asian American Pacific Islander hate with Foodie Fondo. Registration is now open. Wheels down on May 1st. Our next uh, spoke series will feature candidates for borough president. And we have uh, Manhattan on May 10th, as well as Brooklyn on May 11th. Registration uh, for those spoke series are now open as well. But not to worry, Queens and the Bronx, you're up next. May 17th and May 18th, respectively, we're going to feature the borough candidate, the borough president candidates from the Queens and the Bronx as well. So again, check out the links in the chat. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you again, Andy, Terry, Ryan, and Dennis. And thank you again, John. Good night, everybody. Mm -hmm.